Well, good morning to all of you. Welcome to the second week of Advent here at the Resolved Church. Advent means coming, and so this is the time of year where we kind of re-enter into the whole drama of the Christmas story where we are uh, awaiting the coming of Jesus, Jesus to come. Have you guys been just enjoying the season in, in your homes, getting into the, the Christmas spirit? Yeah? Yeah? We've, uh, we've been loving our home. We got one of those... Uh, you know, uh, elves on the shelf, elf on the shelf. Can you have the elf on the shelf? Uh, our our kids named him him Joe. You know, he does all kinds of like mischievous stuff in the night. Like he got into marshmallows the other day uh, here. Um, he, he like hides in the tree. Um, he and then the other night he completely teepeed our entire house when when we woke up. Uh, so that's that's Joe, our our house elf. Supposedly Joe, he's. He's nocturnal, and so he wakes up at night, and then he, he makes a quick trip up to the North Pole to report to Santa on how everybody's doing, and then, and then gets back before, before dawn, before everybody wakes up. And, and, and we love Joe, and I thought I'd tell you the story of, of our, our house elf, Joe, because uh, the second theme of the of Advent is, is humility for this week. And this year, I thought it would be fun and, and helpful to look at the story of the, the true Joe, Joseph, the stepfather of Jesus. So um, he was not an elf, but he was rather a very humble man that, that God used, God chose him to be the human father of Jesus. And, and Joseph, he actually plays a pretty significant role in the whole Advent Christmas story and the coming of Jesus. And the two primary scenes where he shows up, basically they have to do with these two different trips that, that he takes Mary and, and baby Jesus on where they where they hit the road and and so I've titled today's sermon the road of humility so we're gonna look at two passages one from Luke and one from Matthew why don't we stand with me again uh, as, as we read these I know we're a little stand up sit down today but getting some exercise in so that's good all right so first passage from Matthew chapter 2 verses 1 through 5 um, in those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered this was the First registration, when Quinerius was the governor of Syria, and all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling cloth, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the end. Now, we're going to look at Matthew chapter 2, verses 13 through 16. Now, uh, when they, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Rise, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt, and he remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet, Out of Egypt I have called my son. Then Herod, when he saw what had been, been, that he'd been tricked by the wise men, became furious, and he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and all the region who were two years old and under, according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let me pray. God, thank you for this wonderful day that we get to gather as your people, as your sons and daughters, to, to worship you and, and to re-enter the drama of the story, that this great thing that you did in coming to earth in, in Jesus. And so I pray that you bless us by your word and by your spirit, all of us together. Through Jesus, in his name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. If you're a guest today, so glad you, that you've come. Um, I met a few of you on the, the way in at the gate. If I hadn't given you a chance to meet, I'd love, I'd love to meet you. My name is Dwayne. I'm the preaching pastor here. There's, there's six of us pastors or shepherds here who all serve together under our head pastor, our chief shepherd, Jesus. And uh, if you're looking for a church, man, we hope that this might be home. We just want to have a hand in what God is doing in, in your life. We'd love to be a part of that. We're a church that's resolved to love God and, and to love one another, and that's what we're all about. Uh, everybody here should have got one of those little slips of paper on, on your seat. There's a pen there. That's our response card. We want to be a people who are, who are together here on Sunday, that we are all together. And we really come not just to kind of go through the motions of church, but really to and, and to see each other, but also to meet with God, really believing him to do work in us and to speak to us and to lead us and to guide us. So, so just be open to what, what God might be inviting you into today, that you would put on that paper at the end of, 
of this service, and uh, that'll go to our staff and our, and our pastors that pray for them to help you with anything that you, you need in, in getting connected to God and his people. So we actually meet Joe, uh, Jesus' earthly father, not the elf on the shelf, uh, in, in the first chapter of Matthew and then the first chapter of Luke in the Bible. He's, he comes up in this, this long list of names, this long genealogy. They didn't have uh, the DNA tests like like we have today, you know, to find out your entire family history. But they cared a lot about their their family lines, and so they took, like, really good records, tracking back Jesus' family line through 47 generations uh, in, in the book of Matthew that Joseph's line goes through. It's pretty pretty crazy. I was trying to think back, like, how far can I trace my family line? I think I only know, like, maybe three or four generations like 47 that's that's a pretty big deal it turns out that joseph he was he was part of the most famous family line in in the bible some the line where some of the greatest kings and servants of god came out of guys like king david and guys like abraham so so jesus he is actually born into a a royal family line and, and heritage uh, the next thing we find out about him is that that joseph he's fallen in love with this young girl named Mary, who he's decided to marry. Uh, not sure how long they've been, been dating or engaged, but Joe, he had planned to marry Mary until she, he finds out that she's pregnant, and he's, he's pretty upset about it. Not happy. Check it out here. It's in Matthew 1, 18 and 19. Mary had been betrothed to, to Joseph before they came together. She was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit, and her husband, Joseph, being a just man, and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. I had to kind of get into this story and imagine how you would feel. I mean, you've, you've fallen in love with this person. You've, you've worked hard to keep your, your relationship pure, you know, waiting like, you know, waiting for sex until after marriage. But then you find out that the person you're engaged to is pregnant. And you know it's not yours because that hasn't happened yet. And so the only other human explanation is you can come up with is that, well, they cheated on me. They cheated on you. Which throughout all history, all of human history, has been something that, that deeply, deeply wounds and hurts people. You know, when someone cheats on you, there's this deep sense of, of betrayal. And uh, usually it accompanies lots of sadness, anger. Uh, I mean, if you've ever been cheated on, you know, right? That doesn't feel good, right? Uh, back then, uh, being engaged or betrothed, it was actually a, a legal thing, not just a ring thing. And so to be able to break the engagement off would literally require a legal divorce. Uh, but check Joe out. It says, he was a just man, and he did not want to put Mary to shame. I want to put her to shame. Uh, this is where we first kind of start to see the really humble character of Joseph. Uh, even when he can only assume that Mary has cheated on him, he's still gracious and loving toward her. I mean, he wants to honor her justly. Uh, he doesn't want to embarrass her. Instead, uh, he wants to protect her literally from, from public ridicule and scorn. Doesn't want anyone to to shame her. He didn't, he didn't like go off on social media venting about what happened to shame her. He's not gossiping about her. He's not even trying to make her feel bad at, at all. He's a very humble and, and gracious man. I've been trying, attempting to learn about, about shame uh, lately. It's something that many of us deal with. Shame's a big deal. It can literally impact people's lives in a, in a huge way, setting off the trajectory, entire trajectory of their lives. Uh, Kurt Thompson has this great book titled The, the Soul of, of Shame, and, and he defines shame, and go back to that slide, as humiliation, embarrassment, indignity, and disgrace, and, and what happens is that it results in this deprecating view of one's self, where you end up feeling like, I'm not enough, like, there's something wrong with me, uh, I'm bad, or I, I don't matter. Um, any, anybody ever felt like that? I mean, shame, it can come from, from other people. It can come from ourselves. It can be godly or ungodly. Uh, Thompson says this, what we do with shame on an individual level has potentially geometric consequences for any of the social systems we occupy, be that our family, place of employment, church, or larger community. Shame's a big deal. Shame's a big deal. 
thinking about shame, it goes really all the way back to the Garden of Eden where the first man and the first woman, Adam and Eve, they, they unjustly turn away from God and, and the result is they end up feeling shame and they cover themselves and they, and they hide. And then God draws them out of their shame uh, and covers them for them. His own doing. Joseph, he's introduced to us as, as one really that, that begins to turn back the tide of, of shame through the coming of God into the womb of his betrothed. But with Jesus comes the removal of shame, we see in Joseph. It, it starts when, when Joseph has this encounter with God. The, the very next verses say, say this, and as he considered these things, behold, this angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not Fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit, and she'll bear a son and call his name Jesus, and he will save his people from their sins. I want you to know today that in and through the, the work of God, of St. Shame, is something that you experience and you deal with in your life. It, there is an answer for sh the shame that, that we feel. Um, Jesus, he saves us from, from many things, one of them being the sin of shame. Jesus, he was... He was born, really, to die. He was stripped naked on a cross, mocked and spit on. He was shamed for us to take away our shame. And we see that. We see that Jesus was willing to do that. We, we come to understand that we have value and that we have worth in the sight and the eyes of God. When Joseph has this dream saying, to marry Mary anyway, uh, because she was supernaturally impregnated by God with the Savior of the world, uh, which is a crazy idea for Joseph just to even begin to, to, to believe. Uh, he has two different dreams, really, uh, where Joseph encounters one of God's angels to give him very specific information and direction. Um, the two scenes of our primary passage today are incidents where, where God blesses and directs Joseph's steps uh, with Mary and baby Jesus. So look at this, this first one where Joseph, he... He goes up from Galilee, from the town of, of Nazareth to Bethlehem to be registered because the, the emperor has called for this census. I mean, this sucks. I mean, Mary's like full term at this, this point. Um, the reigning ruler of the land calls for a registration. And it was a census not only to count the people, but it was also really for, for money. So you had to go to your hometown. You had to be there in person. You had to give your name, your family line, and history, his lineage, and then you would pay a significant portion of taxes. So uh, Bethlehem, it was, they're living in Nazareth. Bethlehem is, is about 90 miles away, probably the, the rainy season. It's a, a, it says they went up. That's because it, they had to ascend something like a thousand miles in altitude to get there. Now, I know all the like scenes has like Mary on this donkey. The Bible never mentions a donkey. So maybe, maybe there was, but more likely they were on foot. To walk 90 miles up a thousand uh, feet in, in altitude being full term. It can take a few days to get there. Sounds like a fun road trip. Uh, I mean, can you imagine the conversation with, with, with Mary? <laughs> like, babe, I know you're going to hate this, but uh, we got to go to Bethlehem to go pay some taxes um, <laughs> for a few days on foot. Um, yeah, right. Um, when my wife was full term with our first uh, child, I don't. I don't know why. It was a beautiful day out here in San Diego, and I thought it would be just great for us to go to Black's Beach. Um, have you guys ever been there? It's a beautiful beach here in San Diego, um, and it's uh, the, to get there, that's it at the bottom, but the, the trails, like all these steps goes down. It, it descends over a mile um, to get down there. It's like 1.1 miles, and I, I don't know. I thought maybe, I guess, like, I thought, well, maybe this will help the baby come out sooner or something. I didn't think that went through, like, what would happen if she went into labor at the bottom. But, uh, yeah, we, it was pretty brutal. I've never stopped hearing the end of it, that time that I did this, this horrible thing. So uh, some of you, you know, new dads, like, baby on the way, not a good idea. You'll pay for it for the rest of your life. So uh, Mary goes along. With, with Joseph and his, his crazy idea. And, but here's, here's kind of the cool thing. Caesar Augustus, he considered himself to be the, the king of the world. And so he calls for this registration really both to, to demonstrate his power and then also to get, to get money. Uh, what he didn't realize that was that God was, was at work in and through all of that. 
arranging everything so that the true king of the world would be born into the, the royal family line of David in his hometown of Bethlehem, which is exactly what God promised and prophesied that he would do, that Jesus the king would be born in the town of Bethlehem. Philip Ryken, he's a Bible commentator, he says this, although Caesar would never know it, he had unleashed events that would turn the whole world upside down. Through tightening his grip on his huge empire, he so organized things that Jesus, the son of Mary, the son of David, the son of God, destined to sit on the throne of Israel in the world, was born in the city of David, his royal ancestor. What at first appeared to be a great show of Caesar's power actually proved the supremacy of God's sovereignty. Even Caesar's decree was part of the divine plan. What we learn from the humility of Joseph in this is his, his great trust in God, even when things just didn't make sense. You know, there's times where things happen in our lives that are just really confusing and can be really frustrating that happen. In such seasons and trials, it's best to, to humble ourselves, to know and to believe that God is at work. He's, he's at work arranging things according to his divine plan and purposes. And God's, God's always working. His goal is always to bring, to bring Jesus to us, to bring us to Jesus. God's goal is always to draw close to us in and through Jesus and everything that he's doing. Uh, I don't know if you've been going through some things lately that maybe don't make sense or have, have been confusing or been frustrating. Those things can be hard. Just know that God is at work. He is at work and Jesus is coming. Help is on the way. Uh, God is with you and will soon show his goodness to you in and through what you're going through. Well, let's move on and look at the second trip that God sends Joseph on. By this time, Jesus is already born. He's, he's likely at least a, a year old, maybe even almost two, which is why Herod kills all the kids too, and, and under Joseph, Mary, and, and, and Jesus, they've apparently decided to stay in Bethlehem, get a house there, they're raising little baby Jesus, and then, boom, Joseph gets another dream, and he says, the angel says to rise, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt. So Herod, he's the reigning Jewish king in the land, but basically he served as like a puppet king to the, the Roman emperor, to Caesar, who, who allowed him to be king as long as he paid like a hefty portion of taxes, and then he wasn't allowed to, to run a military. Uh, but Herod, he really likes and enjoys his, his place, his seat of power, and when he hears from the wise men that this prophesied J Jewish king, savior, messiah has been born, he feels threatened. And he thinks he's going to lose his seat of power and be overthrown. So once again, God interjects himself and sends Joseph a dream to protect Jesus. This road trip's a lot longer. Bethlehem to Nazareth was 90 miles. Bethlehem just to the border of Egypt was like 450. So pretty big deal. Poor, poor Mary. Here we go again. Hey, babe. Got another dream. <laughs> uh, Got to hit the road. 450 miles. I know you're breastfeeding and changing diapers 10 times a day, but got to go. Brody's got to go, you know. Um, I don't know. What do you think, ladies? <laughs> like, we've had like seven babies born in our church this last year. Like, how many of you, like, yeah, you want to go on a road trip on foot, 450 miles, maybe horse? Sound fun? A um, couple things on this one. First, with, with dreams, thinking about about dreams. Are you any of you out there the kind of people that you like always remember your dreams? Like I never remember my dreams, but my wife and my kids are like every morning telling me what they dreamed last night, you know. Um, <laughs> pretty, I mean, if any one of them told me like, hey, if my wife like in the morning said, hey, like I had a, I had a dream. There's this bad man who wants to kill our kids. So we need to move 450 miles away and be like, okay, babe, it's just a dream. <laughs> it's just a dream. So you don't need to worry about anything. We're not going anywhere. Uh, there's a lot of theories about there, out there about dreams. But if you study dreams in, in the Bible collectively, it all has, uh, it has what it has to say about everything. It has some interesting things to say about, about dreams. And in general, God's people, they're not to to seek dreams, to seek God and his guidance or direction through dreams. So like Deuteronomy chapter 13 says, if a prophet or dreamer of dreams arise among you and, and gives a sign or wonder, like not to, not to listen to them, not to look 
to dreams for, for guidance, oftentimes they can tend to lead us away from God. So dreams can be dangerous. The, the primary way God is always meant and intended to speak to his people is through his written word. That's been true of God's people throughout the ages, Old Testament, New Testament times. However, at the same time, so God gives a strong warning against dreams. At the same time, there's a number of kind of key people in situations where God apparently breaks his own rules. There's, there's an important dream that's given to Jacob, um, one for Joseph today we see, even in the story of Esther. Daniel gets some pretty big dreams. Uh, Joseph in the Old Testament has dreams. Even in the early church in the book of Acts, when, when Peter preaches, there's a passage. He says, hey, you know, in, in, in the last days, you're gonna, there's going to be dreams, and God's going to speak through dreams, and then you see a couple of these incidents take place in, in the book of, uh, book of Acts. So when you look out at the entire plane of the Bible, interesting, we have these places, dreams are, they're here and there, they're not that common, they show up every once in a while, uh, which just in general would say that there's not something that's normally going to happen where God, God directs us through a dream. Uh, but at the same time, it seems then we should be open to them. And the way we know whether it's from God or not is both by what his word says. If it you know, contradicts something that God's word says, you know, it's definitely not from God. And then also from the counsel of his people where there is, there is wisdom. Uh, in Joseph's case, it was, the dream was really specific, had to do with, with Jesus and how God meant him to be the savior of all kinds of men and women, which which is a really good test. You know, if you're trying to test your subjective feelings and, and impressions, a good test is, hey, does it draw me close to Jesus or not? Like, if something draws you close to Jesus, well, that may be God, that he's trying to say something to you and do something to you. If it, if it doesn't, if it's leading you away from God and his people, it's probably not going to be good for you. It's probably not from God. Now, I think, I think what's the bigger thing here isn't so much that Joseph had this like supernatural encounter with God through a dream, but it's what he did with it. How Joseph responded. He listened. He was open to God, and he obeyed, and it took a lot of courage. So once again, Joseph shows himself to be this, this very humble man who actually trusts God with his plan to direct and order the steps of his entire life. That's the true miracle here, I think. You know, most of us, we have this tendency to want to follow our own personal dreams and, and desires without ever even asking God whether this is what he wants for us and if this is his plan for our life and then being willing to submit to him and whatever he's calling us to do. That, to be able to do that, it requires a lot of humility on our part. It requires us really to, to lay down our own preferences and say, well, not my will, Lord, but, but yours. I want what you want, knowing that's going to be best for me to trust you, God. And, and this is really what it comes down to for all of us, is whether we're going to be people like, like Joseph, who, who listen to God's call on our lives, and we respond and we follow and trust him. So Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he was this uh, pastor during World War II who, who opposed Hitler, and he, he wrote this great little book, The Cost of, of Discipleship. And in it, he talks about how, you know, we really, to follow God, we've got to relinquish our attempts to control everything, to control our lives and direct our own lives. He says this, the call to follow implies there is only one way of believing on Jesus Christ, and that is by leaving all and going with the incarnate Son of God. If you want to believe in God, the only way to follow is to follow his incarnate Son. Only he who believes is obedient, and only he who is obedient, believes. Joseph, he, he believed, and he was obedient to God. I mean, he gave up everything. His home, his, his life, his job, uh, this whole new life that they'd been building in Bethlehem since they got there, and move away to this, this place to where the king of kings was to, to rise up and instead... He leaves there, trusting God, going to another country. It was all about Jesus, following God's plan for Jesus. And once again, God was at work in all of it. Just as years ago, God raised up Moses and sent him out of Egypt to deliver his people by, by going down to Egypt and 
once again a true and better deliverer, Jesus Christ, in accordance with the prophecy and promise of God, would, would rise up out of Egypt so that he might deliver all kinds of people everywhere. Today, I just wonder, is there something that, that maybe God would want to say to you today that he's calling you to and inviting you to? Maybe it's something that he wants you to give up or to let go, um, to relinquish. Maybe it's a physical item. Maybe it's something that you've just been holding on to. Maybe there's something that God is challenging you to step out in faith in. What is God wanting to say to you today? It takes a lot of humility to, to lay down our pride, to lay down our preferences, to lay down our plans, and just entrust all of our lives to God. But knowing his ultimate and undeterrable plan, and seeing what he did in Jesus, hearing the Christmas story, knowing that the sending of his son is, into the world is for us, that just seeing the story, it, it frees us, it comforts us, and it really enables us to let go and to dive deep into God's grace and love for everything in our lives. The uh, band's going to start playing here, and we're going to wrap up. I started out the sermon today telling you about uh, Joe, our house elf, uh, who works for Santa. We end with a, a different Joe, seeing a different Joe, Joseph, a man who Instead of being mischievous, was an extremely humble servant of God. Through the gift of God to the Son, to him, Joseph became a great man. God the Father, he allowed Joseph to father his son, God's son. What an honor. What an honor. In humility, Joseph, he, he took on that very humbling task. Joseph cared for Mary with a gospel type of love that didn't that didn't, doesn't shame people, but treats them with kindness and respect. In humility, he set aside his, his own reputation, what other people would think about him, not, not caring in order to care for Mary. Joseph, he entrusted his entire life to God's sovereign plan for him. In humility, he was willing to let go of all his personal dreams and desires to go down a different road than he had planned following God's will for his life. After Jesus' birth and childhood, we never hear of Joseph in the Bible again. He's just, when Jesus dies, Mary's all alone. Joseph's seemingly gone at that point. So Joseph just kind of appears for a blip on the map, and then he's gone. But then that short time, he shows us what it's like to truly love God's Son. In humility, Joseph followed God on the road, not not knowing everything that was going to happen, where God would lead him, but he trusted God with his life, and God blessed him with the greatest gift of all, the gift of his son. So this Christmas season, let's, let's be a people who humble ourselves like Joseph, embracing God's son as, as our own. Let's love and honor others with, with a gospel love that doesn't shame them, but treats them with kindness and respect. And let's trust God like, like Joseph did. Jesus, the greatest prize and gift of all, who we can trust with all of our lives as he leads us to the road to heaven that he has gifted us with.